Avatar The Last Airbender was a show chock full of dramatic intrigue, including quite a few betrayals that left us absolutely shocked. Especially when the live action movie betrayed the sanctity of the show. Boom! Got him! Anyway, let's talk about some betrayals that don't fill us with bad movie flashbacks. Let's start off by addressing the elephant koi in the room, Aang abandoning the airbenders. While this betrayal may not have been intentional, Aang still basically abandoned his people and gave them a death sentence. Would the Fire Nation have killed them all anyway if he had been there? Probably, but when he abandoned his responsibilities as the Avatar, he sealed their fates and gave us our very first hopelessly bleak moment in this children's program. You know, the show made for kids on Nickelodeon. Yeah, here's a freaking skeleton of this man here who died fighting the Fire Nation and protecting his fellow monks after being abandoned by a child saddled with too much responsibility. Seriously, great moment for parents to teach their kids about, uh, let me check my notes here, uh, genocide. Oh, Zuko. Our beloved antagonist turned good guy had a big setback in his road to redemption. He and Katara have a very touching moment where they bond over the trauma of losing their mothers to the Fire Nation. Katara offers to try to heal his scar with the water from the Spirit Oasis, but they're interrupted by Aang and Iroh. It's a good thing though, as Zuko does side with Azula not long after, and Aang is very badly injured and needs the special water. I mean, I guess good thing is relative, but hey, chicks dig scars. Just look at Squall in Final Fantasy VIII. Dude was a chick magnet. Admittedly, his doesn't look like a diaper rash, but you gotta work with what you got, my dudes. Oh, and this betrayal has a lasting impact on Katara, who is the last one of Team Avatar to trust him when he offers to teach Aang firebending and join Team Avatar in their fight against the Fire Nation. While that entry could technically be combined with this next one, I feel like it's important to point out what effect Zuko's betrayal had on Iroh. Despite getting everything that he wanted, the Avatar's death, restored honor, respect in the Fire Kingdom, his beloved uncle's bitter disappointment tainted this moment of victory enough to push Zuko to Team Avatar. Also, if it wasn't for his heartbreaking betrayal, we wouldn't get buff Iroh. And that's not a world I want to live in. Dude's an inspiration for old, tea-loving dudes the world over. Look at those pecs! While we're on the subject of Zuko and his terrible decisions, let's talk about Sparky Sparky Boom Man. Our precious cinnamon roll of an idiot prince hires Combustion Man to kill Team Avatar and then sort of forgets to call him off until it's too late and Combustion Man has a bone to pick with the gang. Luckily, Sokka is a better shot than Zuko is an employer. Poor Combustion Man. And poor Air Temple, its Zillow value will never be the same. Also, priceless artifacts and history and yada yada yada, whatever. Now it's all just prime condominium real estate, baby. Azula is not exactly an amazing friend to Ty Lee and May, and this all comes to a head during Zuko and Sokka's field trip to the Boiling Rock. After May helps Zuko and company escape, Azula is pretty dang peeved. Just as she's about to go in for what would most likely have been a kill shot, Ty Lee incapacitates her and saves May's life. It's this particular betrayal that pushes Azula over the edge and puts her on the path to some serious villainy. Which, you know, for Azula, that's saying something since she's kind of, well, uh, not a nice person to begin with. Meanwhile, Ty Lee wound up joining the Kyoshi Warriors and teaching them to Chi Block while May gets back together with Zuko, who himself becomes the Fire Lord. So really, everything turns out fine for everyone. Well, not Azula. She sucks. And since we're not delving into the comics and later happenings, she doesn't really get much finality like the rest of them. Again, though, that's without getting into the comic book shenanigans where things get complicated for everyone involved, but uh, that's, that's a video for another time. I don't want to say that every Fire Nation royal family member is a bad guy, but... Um, a lot of them are pretty terrible. Sozin and Avatar Roku were childhood friends, but that friendship grew strained when Roku fully came into his avatarhood. Sozin had big dreams of world domination, which Roku wasn't exactly thrilled about. I guess genocidal aspirations just don't sit well with everyone. Who knew? Sozin got his opportunity to move forward unhindered during a volcanic eruption. While Sozin initially helped Roku contain the destruction, he realized that he had a golden opportunity and left his friend to die. Not cool, Sozin. Not cool. 
you jerk. One of the beautiful things about Avatar The Last Airbender is that the writers understood that Aang was a kid and was bound to make questionable choices. It's established early in the series that Sokka and Katara lost their mother to a Fire Nation attack and that their father, Hakoda, had gone off to fight. His status is unknown until Sokka catches wind that he's alive. Aang finds a map that has his location and initially hides it from Katara and Sokka in fear that they'll leave him for their father, which is easy to judge the lad for until you remember that, yeah, he's a kid, and the fear of losing friends is a real serious issue for literal children, even when they're hella powerful elemental chosen ones. Katara and Sokka do find out eventually, and while they're initially very upset, forgive Aang, because they're more than friends. They're... Uh, uh, Dom, can you help me out here? Family. This list really could just be the Zuko and Aang list, which I guess is what makes them such fascinating characters. When Team Avatar finds the library in Book 2, a spirit named Wan Shi Tong informs them that humans are not permitted in the library as they just abuse its knowledge. Which, you know what? I I've seen what we've done with the internet. Fair enough. Aang lies to the spirit, and they're able to convince him to let them look through the library after accepting several donations that will add to the collection. When Wan Shi Tong discovers that they are actually using the library to defeat the Fire Nation, he's uh, less than pleased and sinks the library. Now, if only a giant owl thing could do the same to Twitter, we'd be all set. This next one didn't exactly come as a surprise to viewers, as Longfang and the Dai Li basically had sirens and bad guy alert blaring whenever he was on screen. Longfang initially acts as though he has the Earth Kingdom's best interests at heart, but it's not long before Lake Laogai is discovered and Longfang gets himself on the Avatar's bad side. As if hiding an ongoing war from the Earth King and regularly brainwashing residents weren't enough for his betrayals, Longfang and his loyal Dai Li eventually side with Azula to help her capture Ba Sing Se. He also tried to betray Azula, but she rightfully told him that he was never even a player in the game. A actually, let's hear that exchange real quick. You've beaten me at my own game. Don't flatter yourself. You were never even a player. Cold hearted. <laughs> or, well, I guess, uh, whatever the Fire Nation version of that is. Heartburn? N ah, no, crap. Anyway, Long Feng sucks. Moving on. Katara was basically the moral compass of Team Avatar, and also did her best to keep them on the right path toward their goals. In Book 3, Team Avatar meets Hama, a southern waterbending master. Katara is ecstatic as she thought she was the last waterbender from the southern water tribe. There are subtle hints that Hama may not be as kind as she claims throughout the episode, but it all comes to a head when Hama bloodbends Sokka into trying to stab Aang. Katara proves herself to be a master waterbender in her own right and subdues Hama using her own tricks. Katara is understandably shaken by the experience and vows never to use bloodbending again. Even though, like, I mean, it is super metal. And she does use it again when she's aboard the ship seeking revenge for her mother's death in a moment that is very high on the old emotionometer. And also straight up, I'd just watch a whole show about bloodbending. It's the it's the bending version of just like shredding on a Dragonfire song for 20 straight minutes in Guitar Hero. Uh, am, I, am I dating myself right now? Yeah, whatever. I just love bloodbending. It's so cool. One last bonus entry, just for the heck of it. The Cabbage Guy. My cabbages! Seriously, time and again, this dude is just trying to do his darndest, making a living for himself and according to my extensive fanfiction, to support his struggling but quirky and loving family. Yet every time he seems to find himself in a position to sell those grade A cabbages from his hand-built cart, thereby spreading a healthy vegetarian diet throughout the kingdoms, he is punished by the world around him, including the so-called heroes in Team Avatar, who thoughtlessly destroy his carefully selected produce and force him to scream out his catchphrase, My which quickly descends from hilarity to sadness as we realize, perhaps in conjunction with our cabbage-loving tragic figure, that time is a flat circle of unending pain and misery. For this is not merely a betrayal of one being against another, but the entire cosmos against one man. Hashtag save the cabbages. 
Okay, but seriously, remember the scene in Avengers Endgame where the folks who survived the blip are gathered around and working through their feelings after contending with the most devastating moment of their lives? Yeah, I'm gonna need that for M. Night Shyamalan's Avatar, uh, movie. Yeesh. That's okay. I'm busy with my own stuff. 